All right, so our, our second speaker of the session is Sheldon, Sheldon Jacobson. Uh, so Sheldon Jacobson is a professor and director of the Simulation and Org Optimization Laboratory at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Having grown up in Canada, he is a diehard Montreal, Montreal Canadiens, Canadiens hockey fan, but became interested in NCAA college basketball while a graduate student at Cornell. In an operations research, uh, researcher specializing in stochastic models and uncertainty, he became intrigued by the seed patterns that evolved during NCAA D1 men's basketball tournament. He was named the Professor of Bracketology by the Chicago Tribune in 2010 based on his early work on this topic. So thank you, Sheldon. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Mark and the committee for uh, having me come and make a presentation. Uh, uh, JP's comment about people uh, coming to Canada is very true because I'm a Canadian who left Canada, so it's also very easy for us to leave Canada as well as coming to Canada. Uh, the work that we've done is, uh, is really a cornucopia of excitement in the NCAA basketball tournament. There's just so many numbers going on, and I work in a field called operations research, and what we do is the kinds of things that we do in the lab are aviation security, system analysis, and vaccine economics, so we, we do this also because it's kind of fun. I refer to it as our bedtime research because it's not stuff that any of my PhD students, and in fact the co-authors on this work are in fact current and former PhD students who uh, one of them is an academic, one is going to be graduating soon, and one of them started a, a center. So as a result, this gives us an opportunity to, uh, to do something which is fun and interesting, and students are very excited, and we actually created a website that I'll tell you about afterwards. Uh, I want to take a little poll right now. Uh, Mark had pointed out that the odds of a satellite piece falling on someone was around 3,200 to 1. For those of you who are familiar with March Madness, who thinks it's more or less likely that we will see a 16 seed, any 16 seed in the final four? How many people think it's more likely? How many people think it's less likely? Well, the interesting thing, this is for a given year, it turns out the odds are very close. They're within an order of magnitude. And the point is, it is observations like that that we began to make in our analysis that suggested that someone had to put something together to find out what's really going on because our intuition on odds rarely matches reality. Well. I'm going to go quickly through this because how many people are familiar with March Madness? I'm preaching to the choir, am I not? Yes. So with March Madness, it's a tournament which goes on every March. It's exciting. Basketball season is starting very soon, of course, for college basketball. We're going to have Midnight Madness in many schools. I think at Illinois they're going to be doing something like that. And the tournament's been around for quite a while. We focused our attention on what we refer to as the modern era of the tournament, which is 1985 and since when they went to the 64 team. They've been tweaking it. We're up to 68 teams with the first four and play-in games and all that stuff. It doesn't really change the fundamental structure of the bracket. And of course, this is a very big gambling event. So a, a number of you probably have participated in the ESPN event where they had close to 6 million uh, entries last year, which is actually quite exciting. Now, how do you predict the winners? Well, you can look at the odds. You can look at the seeds. You can do a variety of things to help people predict any one game winner. But we're dealing with a sequence of games that ultimately culminate in a final winner for the tournament. So the question is, are there ways that we can, in fact, use information to help us make these kinds of decisions? Now, the basic tournament structure is very important. And the good thing is, is it's been predictable like I said, now for almost three decades. Uh, there are a certain number of at-large participants and a certain number of conference champions. There are the power conferences, the so-called big six, and then you have all these other mid-major and smaller conferences who get a team in. Typically, they end up being seated 16, 15, 14, sometimes 13 as well. And everybody is seated from 1 to 16, of course, and there's a certain format, so teams play each other in certain patterns. Now, this is a typical bracket that we see here, and what I've done is I've shown in each of the rounds, and I've left out the first, the first four play-in games, there are certain ways that teams will play each other, and it creates what I now have are sets, oh my, oh my, if my wife knew I had this, she'd be worried. <laughs> so, and it sort of takes, create certain sets of teams that could reach a certain round in certain places. So there are really sub-brackets within the bracket. 
That's very, very important because we often think about, well, which team's going to make it to the final four? But the sub-brackets make a big difference. What is the most common double-digit seed that seems to like to make the final four? 11. Made it three times now. And uh, they don't go far once they get there, but nonetheless, they do get there. But their path, there's a reason there's a path there for them. Now, you could say that about anyone in this lower part, and it's, there is some truth to that. The last thing you want to be, if you want to be a weak seed, is an eight or nine, because what are you going to do in the second round if you win? You're going to play a number one seed, and that, of course, is a real problem. So there's, these patterns certainly evolve, and here I have all of the better seeds passing through, and eventually we end up with our regional winner, and then they go to the final four and live happily ever after. So in the final four, of course, we have each of the regional winners. They play each other, and we end up with a tournament champion. So it comes down that the committee has invested a tremendous amount of time and energy to seed the teams. And a fundamental assumption that we make is that although the teams may be different, the criteria that they use are fundamentally the same. If we're willing to accept that assumption, and our model will bear that out, it's interesting how the seed position becomes so critical in determining how teams will advance through the tournament. So the selection committee has to do an important job. They have to be consistent in what they're doing. And as long as they are, ultimately, those patterns will evolve out in the tournament as it plays. Now, if you look at facts, and we've analyzed the tournament in so many different ways and how the seeds have progressed, and I'm always amazed when people, you know, pick a certain number of upsets, uh, and, and there's... It, we often do it based on emotion, or we like the, the mascot of the team, whatever it may be. I mean, people have all these funny things. I, last year, I did a, a, a public radio interview for, I think it was Connecticut Public Radio, and, and they were putting me up against a cat. And I don't... I, I, I don't... No. And quite frankly, I think the cat won, because uh, do a, they do a fine job. Now, the point is, though, if you look at how teams have progressed, and our original research on this, which we published in 2009, focused on seeds one, two, and three and how their performance evolves. And this is how we got our foot in the door in this research. So we compared seeds number one versus seeds number two and seeds number three, and how do they compare? And what we found is in the early rounds, seed number ones do better than seed number two, which do better than seed number three. But once you start to sneak into the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight and beyond, you start to realize their performance begins to meld with each other. And in fact, the top three seeds, basically the top 12 teams, are well represented among the champions. I mean, you get all the way up to 89% of them being, in fact, champions. So as a result of that, what else could we use? Is there something that will help us, in fact, determine the way in which the, the seeds will evolve through the tournament? So the goal of our study is basically to take the historical data and analyze it and see if we can create a mathematical model to help us, in fact, evaluate brackets. Uh, we do this based on the fact, and a very another important assumption, which is that if you're a one seed, whether you're the best one seed or the worst one seed, you are going to be, for our intents and purpose, all intents and purposes, indistinguishable. Same with the two seeds. They will all be indistinguishable. So we focus on seed distributions as opposed to team distributions, which is why that if there is a pattern that evolves based on seeds, after you've determined your seed bracket, you fill in your teams, as opposed to filling in your teams and looking at your seeds. We suggest you do it opposite, if there is such a model. The nice thing is the NCA has wonderful data. We did not include this year's data, although I have updated it finally, and we'll be putting up uh, the new results shortly, but nonetheless, we haven't done that. And we use a very basic chi-squared goodness of fit test to do our statistical fitting. Now, given the fact that you have 63 games, we're ignoring the play-in games. Over 26 years, you have a lot of games. The difficulty, of course, is that uh, not all seeds are equally represented. Now, you always have a one playing a 16 in the first round. And true, the one will either always play an eight or a nine in the second round, but ones occasionally do lose. We did see that very recently when uh, Kansas uh, got taken out. Uh, I guess it was by Northern Iowa a couple years ago. Uh, but if you look at the twos and the threes and the fours, the, the number of occurrences of the different pairings start to, in fact, be quite diffuse. 
So in essence, we have to make the assumption that the historical data is representative of what's really going on, that the committee has done a good job and has done a consistent job so that we can, in fact, glean a pattern that's coming out. Now, what's the math behind the numbers? I'm going to give you a little bit of a math. Mark, Mark said, you know, give him some math, but don't give him too much. So I'm going to give you a little bit of math. The geometric distribution. It's a wonderful distribution. In fact, <laughs> I, I call it to my students in my stochastic processes class, it's one of your friends because it shows up so often. Now, without realizing it, how many people have heard of a geometric distribution? Okay, most of you have. If you haven't, it's basically, think of it as the following. You have a coin which has a certain probability of a head and a certain probability of a tail. You want to know how many flips does it take until you get the first head. And that count of the number of trials until your first success is a geometric distribution. And it has a certain probability mass function, as I give here, where P is this probability of a success. Very simple distribution. Turns out there's an interesting theorem, which the assumption in the geometric uh, distribution is you have these so-called coin flips. They're called Bernoulli trials. It was mentioned earlier. And they have to be independent. Well, there's a very interesting result in 2004, which gives you an alternative way to measure whether, in fact, you have a geometric distribution. And it still is based on Bernoulli trials, but it does not explicitly make the assumption of independence, although independence is there. But it gives you a condition based on this conditional probability. Well, what this suggests is it gives us a necessary and sufficient condition for the geometric random variable to hold. But the intuition behind it, and this is where we made the aha moment, is that if the first i minus 1 seat positions have not advanced to the next round, then the probability of the i seat position advances is p, the same value for all the seed positions. So we're not talking about particular teams. We're talking about how the positions evolve. And the, in, the interesting thing is, and it's one of those accidental moments, not quite at the level that Louis Pasteur uh, um, discovered penicillin. I, I believe he had discovered it. It, but it was like one of those, wow, isn't this interesting? And we said, will it hold? Well, the thing is, you can't compare in the second round seed number one to seed number 11. And the reason is they never don't meet in the second round. It's impossible. You have to, in fact, create sets of seeds that have the potential ability to reach each other and play each other, which means a one and an eight and a 9 and a 16 could meet each other, potentially some combination in the second round. One would play 16, 8 would play 9, and the winners could end up in the second round. So we create these sub-brackets that evolve, but eventually converge to all of the teams being in the bracket. That's a critical observation, because what it means is that if we create these sub-brackets carefully, we can literally fit these geometric distributions to the data and come up with a predictive tool. Well, now the only problem, of course, is we don't have a geometric distribution because the number of possible values goes from 1 to infinity. We only go to 16. In fact, we go through a lot less because we're counting the positions. So we have to use a truncated geometric distribution which means that we have a set of truncated distributions based on the sub-brackets, which we call sets. And that's why we point out is that this success probability now must be estimated for each position in each set in each round. So we're taking this truncated geometric and we're putting it on steroids, so to speak. And we're going to let it do wild things and see what happens. Well, we actually did the testing for all of the rounds and it turns out in the first round, there are eight sets of two teams each. In the second round, there are four sets of four uh, teams each. In the third round, there are two sets of eight teams each. And then you have all 16 teams in each of the final rounds. And what we did is we estimated, based on historical data, all of those conditional probabilities. And what we want is if the geometric distribution structure holds, then in each of these columns, within each of the rounds, the numbers should be close. So the first round, you have one value. It's not much going on there. In the second round, they really aren't close, which means that we don't really believe that the model fits well. And here, in the third round, you start to think, well, that's the first set isn't very good. That's the set including seed one. Set two, though, they're not bad. And you start to realize they're getting pretty darn close to each other within reasonable statistical error. 
And that's when we said, well, if this is the case, we should be able to take all this data, estimate our success probabilities within each set, and come up with a model that will measure the probability of these sets evolving in the tournament. So we actually came up with probabilities of seed combinations, and we only looked at the national champion, of course, the national championship game, which, which is the national uh, semifinal, or the game before the semifinals, and then also we went back to the Elite Eight um, and looked at what was happening and seeing if this model would, in fact, provide some predictive probabilistic assessment value. And we ran all the numbers. Now, we had to estimate these probabilities of success, which we did, but our focus was on the seed combinations, not on the teams, because our basic assumption is that all teams within a seed are created equal. A lot of people don't like that. I don't like that. But on the other hand, it seems to be the case. So how did we estimate P? Well, we estimated these P's based on the set. So it turns out in the Elite Eight, we had two sets, and then the, la the next three situations, we had one set, and we estimated these P's for the truncated distribution using basically a bisection algorithm. And these are the values from last year that we inputted into our model. And now we can compute things. So let's talk about the final four, because everybody loves to talk about the final four. I'm going to give you some results for the final four. This is a table, and it does not include last year. Of course, we had Connecticut winning, which was a number three seed. Here are the 16 seed positions. Here's the actual number of times that they've appeared in the final four. This, of course, is now up to three, uh, because, and we also have an extra, um, we should have an eight appearing because of, uh, over there because of Butler last year. And this is the expected number of times that it should appear based on our model. And here is the component which goes into the chi-squared goodness of fit. Now, notice 11 is a real problem. It continues to baffle because it shouldn't be appearing as often as it is, and it's still appearing. And in fact, it does change the analysis. But even doing that, we're able to get a reasonable fit. And the new numbers, like I said, will come out once basketball season begins. But here are some of the things that we can actually use this model to compute. For example, how, if you have a situation where there are zero number one seeds in your final four, the probability of that occurring is 0 0.130. We compute it with our model. It's expected occurrence then, which is, is going to be 3.4. So that means uh, we should expect it over the last, since 1985, 3.4 times. We've only observed it once. So it's expected frequency. This would be 20, uh, it would be 25 years, 26 years over 3.4 would give us 7.7. .7. How about one number seed? one number one seed, or two number one seeds, or three or four. And you can see what their expected frequency should be, how many times they've actually occurred, and how often you'd expect them. The one which is always amazing is, it's hard to imagine a number one seed not making the final four. They look so good. But it's only occurred once, and it was just a few years ago that it occurred. Uh, but it's actually the rarest combination. I'd rather choose no number one seeds, as we just had this year, this past year, rather than four number one seeds. It's around five times more likely, based on our model. So these are some of the things that we can compute. Now, what are the most common or probable final four combinations? Well, it turns out the seed combination of one, one, two, three falls in that group. It's occurred three times. The probability that we compute it to be is 0 0.066, so its expected frequency is once every 15 years. And basically, in the last 26 tournaments, it's occurred three times, which seems pretty reasonable based on statistical sampling of a, such a small size. The next most common seed combination is 1112. It occurred in 1993 with a probability in our model of 0 0.062, expected frequency once every 16 years. 1122 is the next most common in 2007. The next one is 1223 in 1994 and 2004. The next one after that is four ones, which has occurred once. And then we have one, two, three, three, which has occurred three times, interestingly enough. And then we go all the way down, except for this past year, the rarest final four seed combination was back in 2000, which is 1588, which has the expected frequency of once every 32,000 years. Now, you may ask, what about last year? Well, I computed last year. And it turns out with last year, the odds of that final four seed combination, which was a three, a four, an eight, and an 11, 
was approximately 125,000 to 1. It's never been that rare. Now, what's interesting is that if you actually look at the specific teams, because I can make some adjustments, then the odds of that final four seed combination was around 2.9 million to 1. Now, what's interesting about that is that the ESPN challenge, and it turns out I got an email. I was driving to the airport, and I get an email, so I get to the airport so I can kind of respond. And it was from a writer um, from Slate. Does that sound familiar? And, uh, and he said, uh, and I give him all these numbers, and he said the ESPN challenge had 5.9 million entries, 6 million entries, and they had two people who got this final four. And I, he said, what are your odds? I said, well, for this combination, it's 125,000 to 1. For this particular set, it's 2.9 million to 1. He said, that's pretty interesting, because 5.9 million divided by 2 is 2.95, which was a small amount of evidence that maybe there's something going on here. Well, here's some interesting statistics on final four seed combinations, which are, in some sense, counterintuitive, but at least give you an idea. And these are, once again, based on the data we had through 2010. One or more 16 seeds being in the final four is 1307 to 1. If you want to make it for exactly one team, it's around 5 million, 5,000, uh, or not by 1.3 1, 1. million, it's 1,307 1, to 1. While if you put a particular team, it's going to end up being around a little over 5,000 to 1, which is on the order of the 3,200 that we talked about for a satellite piece falling on us. So if you're worried about the satellite, you should pick a 16 seed. Uh, one or more 15 or 16 seeds, the probability is around 0 0.002037, occurs approximately once every 491 years. 14, 15, or 16, once every 241 years. 13 or worse, 130 to 1 years. And you're getting into reasonable odds now. And then you start to go to 12 or worse, it's 74 to 1. 11 or worse, 43 to 1. Very reasonable odds. Yet we're surprised to see an 11 seed in the final four, and we shouldn't be. It's occurred three times, so as a result, we start to see these patterns. What about all 16 seeds in the final four? 747 trillion to one. That's n if you put down a penny, I suppose you can make a lot of money if you can find someone to take your bet. But nonetheless, it is very, very rare. How about having no ones, twos, or threes in the final four? It occur the odds are around 454 to one. So it's on the same order as having a 15 or a 16 in the final four, just to give you the comparison. Very counterintuitive because our instincts say, well, gee, we have to have a one in there, but a 15 or a 16, wow, it doesn't make any sense. What about no ones or twos? Well, that one is 59 to one. And of course, we saw that this past year. So the point being is that the model seems to indicate interesting trends that evolve and come out from this analysis that maybe our instincts are not always so clear on. So if we look at, and it should be 2011, I realize, because that was the tournament. So I went back and I analyzed, and these are the things I told you about. The odds for 3, 4, 8, and 11 are oh, 121,000 to 1. Against this particular set was 2.9 million to 1. The probability of UConn winning the national championship was 0 .0306 based on our model. The number of ESPN brackets, like I said, was 5.9 million. The number who chose UConn was a little over 279,000. Based on our model, we, we would have predicted around 180,000 of them. So in essence, the model is being predictive in being able to assess a team getting through the tournament. I do the same thing for Kentucky. In the same ESPN, the uh, number of brackets which had Kentucky was a little over 107,000. We, we said there should be an expected number of 89,000. For Butler, there were a little over 4,000. Our expectation was 5,100. And for VCU, there were a little over 1,000, and our expectation was around 600. Numbers well within a reasonable range. So the conclusions and limitations are we have a model here that based on a truncated geometric distribution, could actually assess likelihoods of seed combinations that have never even occurred, like 416 seeds occurring in the final four. Uh, now, the trouble, of course, is that changes do occur. If the selection committee started to make changes, if we started to change the way the game is played, uh, when we went to the 35-second clock, the three-point arc, all these things could have an impact on the model. So as a result, there are certain limitations based on what could potentially happen in the future. 
The other thing is the probabilities of successes have to be changed every year, and I do update them every year, and I have them updated for next year. I took this and threw this at a couple of our undergraduates at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign who are very creative and like basketball, and I said, make a website out of this. And we did, and it's called Bracket Odds. And you can visit it. Here's the website page, bracketodds.cs.illinois.edu. And it enables you to put in your seed combinations and come up with probabilities and odds of what your bracket looks like. So if you have something that's really out there, you may say, yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. I like odds which are 2.7 million to 1. Or you can say, I'm going to play it safe, but you can may discover that safe isn't always good odds. Safe is just what you perceive to be safe. The other thing to note is that the website has certain functionalities. It basically covers the Elite Eight, the Final Four, the National Finals, and the National Champions. It also has a flexibility to enable you to compare seed combinations in these rounds, which is really important so that you can say, I'm going to try this, but I'll try something else. You put them both in, it gives you a comparison, which we think is kind of neat. And the other thing to note is that our model is really much more complex than what's on the website. The website represents 10 or 20% of the functionality of the model. So if people have specific requests, and I'm not putting this as an invitation, but I will mention it, but if you have specific requests about combinations of seeds, I can go to my desktop and do some things that the model on our website cannot do, and I can compute things which are really bizarre, like some of the things I gave you before. You can't get those directly off the website, but I can do them based on manipulating our model. So I want to thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about this. We have time for one question. Yes. Absolutely. Well, when you take the 2 to the power of 63, of course, you're assuming a uniform distribution across every single possible bracket. What you're proposing is to actually realize that they should be weighted differently and then take a weighted sum uh, rather than an unweighted sum. We have not personally done that. Um, but it'd be an interesting idea, certainly. All right, let's thank let's thank the speaker once more.